And the problem is that most people do not engage themselves in the activity of prayer to the point that, that it becomes almost an obsession if you engage in prayer on a daily basis, which you're going you're gonna to see the fruit of it almost immediately, and you're going to get to the level where you almost become addicted to it. And you're not going to feel right on the days when you don't pray. And the normal, and the norm for you is going to be actually praying instead of not praying, instead of the other way around, which seems to be the common denominator for most Christians. You're going to find yourself doing crazy things, like sneaking off into the bathroom when you don't really have to go pee simply because you want to pray for a couple of moments. Maybe, maybe you don't smoke, so you don't have the excuse that you're going to step outside of work just for a smoke, so you actually have to step outside to pray. And if you say that, you're weird, so you have to excuse yourself and go to the bathroom. Forgive me, Lord, for I have sinned. I told everybody I have to go to the bathroom. I don't really. I just wanted to spend a couple of moments with you because I need you. I do that all the time find myself going into my Jeep, find myself running errands. I don't have to run in the middle of the day because I feel a necessity for me to be connected with the Almighty God. I'm telling you, when you get the bite of prayer, you become almost obsessed with it, and you recognize why Jesus made a big deal out of it. I mean, come on. If Jesus made a big deal about prayer, how many of you know that probably most of us, he who was not flawed prayed, how, many, how much more do we who are flawed probably need to get on our knees and go to the Lord Almighty, huh? By the way, Kelly, you do know you have to sing after the service too, right? I just feel like sometimes he just leaves everything. In the, I, I, do you even have a voice left? Can you even talk right now? Oh, man, I, don't, I wish I had your gift. I do. I, if I say good morning to somebody, there, there goes my, my, my voice is shot. <laughs> I can't lead worship today. My voice is shot. We have perceived, and this is still my introduction, so please just hear me, hear me out because this is really resonated in my heart. I'm very excited about this series. We're going to be talking about a few things. We're going to be discussing the Lord's Prayer in the future, the model. Do we say it? Do we recite it? Do we, is it a model? Do we, I mean, we're going to be answering some questions. But let me tackle something within church culture that we have, we have perceived for a long time that to be spiritually mature, somebody has to display some level of eccentricity. Meaning, let me explain that to the kiddos. Some people believe that if you're spiritually mature, you have to be a little weird. Some people have the gift of prophecy, and so we think, that, oh, you know, if that person has the gift of prophecy and they can say something about your past, present, or your future, then they must be spiritually mature. Or if maybe somebody has the gift of laying on hands, and every time they lay hands on you and they pray for you, it seems like they get filled with a, with a, with a gift of the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And we look at the person and we say, wow, they must be spiritually mature. Or if maybe somebody has the gift of healing, and they have the faith and the ability to lay hands on somebody, and when they do, the cancer falls right off of them. Or the fever resides. And as wonderful as that is, as that is so within church culture, we seem to look at an individual like that and we say, wow, they must be spiritually mature. And I don't necessarily believe that that needs to be true because we forget that if you have the gift of healing, it is that, the gift. Meaning that the emphasis should never be on the individual performing the gift, but the emphasis should be on the one that gave the gift. So to me... And I believe in all of these things, man. I'm telling you. I mean, I, I had somebody come up to me just this week and say, I need you to pray for me. And the reason they wanted me to pray for them is because they knew that I was filled with the Holy Spirit. They knew that I spoke in tongues and they needed healing in their body. And so, I, and, and so they just very plainly just said, I want you to pray over me. I want you to lay hands and, and I want you to do the tongues thing. I want you to do, you got to do that. <laughs> And that's fine. I, did, I mean, listen, I have the faith to believe that God can heal anything and anyone. However, it was interesting to me that that person viewed me as a spiritually mature person simply because I had the gift of the Holy Spirit, not recognizing that the gift is something that is available to every single one of us, not just the pastor. Huh? And so... I prayed for them, but I thought it was interesting that. So listen, let me just give you my personal definition of what it means to be spiritually mature. Because what it means to be spiritually mature is the consistent application of the elementary things. Because I have seen many people that move in the gifts of the spirits that are jerks. 
Because for whatever reason, God in his grace chose to give his precious gift to a person that's by nature kind of a jerk. I'm kind of a pastor jerk sometimes. I think if you spend some time with me, you'll know that I, I don't have within me the warm, nurturing, hard, you know, a tender heart that, a, that a most people what my pastor friends have, I don't. I'm like, you got a problem. We should pray for deliverance over you right now. I'm not going to call you. I don't have that much time to counsel you. Let's just pray the counselor over you. You'll be fixed, and let's walk together. <laughs> so the consistent application of elementary things, meaning, very simple, do you love God? <laughs> Number one, I'm going to give you three. Somebody write it. I just wrote down an outline. I don't write down outlines. I have three things right now. Put, make, put, put this on YouTube. Three things. Number one, do you love God? I mean, Jesus was at, listen, there was over 330 Old Testament laws. And by the time Jesus steps into the New Testament scene, they had added another 300. There was over 600 laws in the New Testament, in the Old and New Testament. And the Pharisees looked at Jesus and they asked him, what is the greatest command? And everybody knows it. And Jesus very simply said, you need to love God. The basic application of elementary things, meaning, do you love God? As a secondary consequence of that love, do you love people? Because you can say you love people, but you're never really going to love people unless you love God, who's the one who created people. I mean, is that just too basic? There's not a whole lot going on up here, okay? So think, so you, you need to get used to a level of simplicity when it comes to the gospel. Do you love God? Do you love people as a secondary consequence of your love for God? And third of all, do you pray? Because you cannot say that you love somebody and spend no time with them. And the way that you spend time with God is through personal prayer. So then the question that I would render to you is, are you a person of prayer? Are you an adult of prayer? Are you a man of prayer? Are you a woman of prayer? Are you a child of prayer? Are you a teenager of prayer? Listen, it has nothing to do with, with financial demographic or, or ethnic background. It has everything to do with, are you a person of prayer? I lay hands on my kids every night, and we pray together. Sometimes I'll ask my Emma to pray, pray, and she prays. I ask my Avery to pray. Sometimes she prays. I ask my little Frankie to pray, and God forbid, you need to be careful with the things she prays, but she prays. She prays. Huh? And so I would say, man, do, do, you, are you, do you really, like when somebody asks you to pray within a public forum, is there a sense of excitement and of awe that comes over you because you are given the opportunity to represent the Almighty God in the public arena? Or do you shy back in embarrassment because you have no personal prayer life, so God forbid now you ask me to pray out loud in front of other people when I don't do it by myself? And that sounds harsh, but please understand. And listen, maybe that's a bad gauge. But sometimes there's something that perks up in my heart whenever I ask somebody to pray and they say, no. W what is that? And, and like I said, maybe, I'm just, maybe it's just my humanity coming out. But to be honest, because I, listen, I remember being in Bible college. And I was asked to do the opening prayer for one of the services at Bible college in front of 1,800 kids. And I, and I got up there. And I forgot everything I was going to pray. I mean, I, I just stumbled over my word. You know, I, I began to pray for, for odd, odd things. I remember asking God, for, you know, to, to be with the homosexuals and the bisexuals and the trisexuals because they'll try anything. And not be, I mean, just random. Cra See, I, I, I could not believe the words that were coming out of my mouth. And I'm like, oh, no, put them back inside. And I, I just got, I couldn't do it. 1,800 people. I said, in fact, I still remember after the service, a kid, a friend of mine on Facebook, which I don't know why I'm his friend on Facebook. I didn't like him when it was face to face. But <laughs> I just said, okay, I, I confirm your friendship over Facebook. It's so deep. But his name is, oh, and I won't give you his name because it's going to go on YouTube, I think, and he might know. So, uh, but he was a friend of mine, a friend, a, you know, he came up to me after the service and he said, have you ever prayed? <laughs> And I just felt, listen, I already felt horrible. And then he was like pouring hot coals on my head. It was horrible. And to be honest with you, I loved God at that point. I mean, God had already called me into the ministry to be a pastor. 
I mean, I was in charge of the missions department, praying for all the missionaries, and I was part of, uh, you know, student government. I was the treasurer. Can you believe that? I was the student body treasurer for my class. I can't even add right. <laughs> I told them that. I'm like, you know, I had to take basic math when I, was, when I got to college because my math credentials from high school didn't really apply to Bible. And they're like, oh, we just need your face. Okay, sure. I literally did nothing for that entire year other than just show up at the meetings. But apparently, we were doing something significant. I, all that just to say that I was really involved in a lot of things. Yet when I stood up in front of prayer, I couldn't, I, the words just escaped my mouth. So maybe it shouldn't be so harsh on people who don't pray publicly, but I'm just saying, if there is a level of intimacy that you share with God in the public forum, when he calls you to the public arena, there's going to be a sense of readiness in your heart. And so are you a person of prayer? Are you a man of prayer? Do your kids see you praying? Are you a parent of prayer? Are you a child of prayer? Are you a teenager of prayer? Or do we just function through life knowing that there's a God out there that has very little to do with our plans because it's about building our own kingdom? The basic application of elementary things in a consistent way. You do know that the disciples never once asked Jesus, hey, teach us how to walk on water. Teach us how to raise the dead. Teach us how to heal the sick. Teach us how to wipe blindness out of people's lives. Teach us how to do that feeding of the 5,000 thing because that was awesome, man. We could start right now. I mean, we could start a bakery and kill it. Not one time did they ask any of that. Not one time did they ask, hey, teach us how to lay hands on the skin of somebody that has been afflicted by the cancer of leprosy and we'll watch them get healed. No, but you know what they did ask? They looked at Jesus and they said, teach us how to pray. Because they knew and they understood that the source that caused the power by which all these miraculous things were happening was rooted in his daily application of prayer. They understood that when Jesus did something amazing, he always went up to the mountainside and prayed. And they knew that it was his personal prayer life that caused the impossible to become possible. It was his prayer life that caused the things that were in the minds of people an impossibility to now enter the realm of the possibilities, and they were watching it. And so the disciples never once, they teach us how to do all these wonderful, awesome things you're doing, but they did look at Jesus and they said, please, Lord, please, Master, please, Teacher, teach us how to pray because we don't know. And if there's something that's going to be a large motivator in your prayer life, it's going to be the, fact, the fruit that you're going to see results. But it is when you pray and you see nothing happen that you get discouraged and we stop. But what I'm telling you is that we need to get to the place where prayer becomes such an obsession that you see the fruit of it every single day. Do we pray? The basic definition of prayer I've heard even people say that the basic definition of prayer is talking to God. I would largely disagree with that. Because at the lowest common denominator, the definition of prayer should be communicating with God. Because it's not just do on, doing all the talking, but when you communicate with somebody, it also engages the mind in the level of listening. So, pray, if, so if prayer is nothing more and nothing less than communicating with God, because it involves not only talking, but listening, then the purpose of prayer is to ask or to petition God in a particular matter, because chances are that it matters. It matters to you. It matters to the person you're praying for. It matters to the people who don't even believe in prayer, who are just looking at your life, waiting for the answer to prayer to become more than a test, but a testimony, which will in return cause them to also want to pray. It matters. So the definition of prayer is communicating with God, and the reason for prayer is to petition God for something that matters because it matters to you, it matters to us, it matters to everybody around us. So we're going to read a passage of Scripture in which there was... A man that prayed a very short prayer that gave him an incredible return 
on his prayer, meaning that it doesn't always have to be long, beloved. It doesn't always have to last for an hour, but it does have to be honest, and it does have to be directed at the master, from your heart to his. So if you got your Bibles, we're going to go to the book of Matthew chapter 14, beginning with verse 22. And I know that was a long introduction. Sorry, kids. I said more than I in- intended to say. I'll have to take some things away from the sermon so that those who are here for the first time will want to come back. Man, you are speaking a lot. Hey, do you ever, did you ever wonder what happened right after the feeding of the 5,000? Everybody has heard the feeding of the 5,000, right? In fact, let me, let me just, before we stand and before we read the scripture, let, let me just, let me give you a freebie real quick. Now, those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So 5,000 men, not counting the women, another 5,000, not counting the children, assuming everybody had one kid, and with the lack of birth control back in those days, I highly doubt that. But let's just keep things at a low level, 15,000 possibly fed. Everybody knows the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, and Jesus fed the 5,000. Well, what happened right after that? This is where we pick it up. If you would stand with us, if you got your Bible, that's phenomenal. If you don't, George is going to throw it up there on the screen. Book of St. Matthew, Division 14, beginning with verse 22. It reads like this. Oh, man, I love this book. <laughs> All right, everybody ready for a good story? You, this is a story that you have heard in the past, and we're going to revisit it and pull some things in regards to prayer. But let's just begin with verse 22, and it reads like this. Remember, Jesus has just fed the 5,000, and the very first word after that incredible miracle is this. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, so I, I picture it like Jesus is like the pastor, and then he's like, thank you, worship team. You guys can go home, do, do whatever you want. I'm going to go to the back of the church and just connect with people and shake everybody's hands. That's kind of what, you know, he's connecting with everybody and saying, okay, you, can't stay, you, don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. So he sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself. To pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Come on, how many people feel like life is contrary? <laughs> You're like, you, you want to follow God, you want to do his will, you're joining the team, but it, just, it seems like I'm going in the right direction, but everything is contrary. <laughs> Everything's going the other way. So the wind was contrary, the Bible says. Now in the fourth watch, we'll talk about that later on in the series, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. The dude is walking on the water. Walking on water. Pretty remarkable. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you thought the five, feeding the 5,000 with just this little basket was a big deal. Check this out. <laughs> I don't know. I just picture him that way, like smiling while he's doing it. Now, on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. I would think if I saw somebody walking on top of the water, it would cause some level of anxiety in myself too. They were troubled, the Bible says, saying it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. By the way, this made me feel pretty good because you, you guys remember how I told you last week that sometimes I like to pray like real early in the morning in some field over in La Trobe and I was listening and like the wind picked up like a leaf and it was headed my way and because it was so dark I could have sworn it was the Sasquatch trying to violate me 
And, and I ran. I literally ran to try to get into my Jeep. And my Jeep, it, door's broken. So I couldn't get, I mean, it was. <laughs> and they had each other. I was by myself, okay? So, so let, me just, let me just read that again because it brings uh, solace to my soul. And they cried out for fear. <laughs> Come on, guys. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Come on, all you need is a word. And when Peter, en- and- and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Why would he say that? I mean, the common response would have been like, Oh, man, it's you. Awesome. Get in the boat. But Peter's a little like, hey, can I try that? All right. So he said, come. What if it wasn't Jesus? Whoa! <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he, there's a lot of faith happening here, folks. I'm sorry. Let me just read the scripture, okay? I just can't help but interrupt myself when I'm reading the word because it is alive to me and I'm picturing it in my mind. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Peter is walking on the water. Peter is walking on the water. All right. So he said, come. And when Peter had come out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, He was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? He's like, boy, I was with you, bro. I was with you. And when they got into the boat, the wind, and and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him and said, truly, you are the Son of God. Really? The changing water into wine didn't do it for you? The feeding the 15,000 people with a little basket didn't do it for you? I'm glad we finally convinced you, disciples. Let's pray. Father, we love you, Lord. And I thank you for the reality and the wonderful truth that are in your word, Father, that reveal such humanity in those that we call saints of God, God. I thank you, Lord, that we can look at their, 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 their doubt, that we can look at their sometimes lack of faith, as Jesus would even verbalize that, you little faith. And I thank you, Father, that you have revealed all this, Lord, so that we can draw some strength from it and understand that we don't have to have it all together, but that we do have to keep our eyes fixed on you, and you got our backs. We love you so much. I pray that you be with reach kids, Lord, when they make their way back. I pray that they will be attentive to what Miss Shannon has to share. I pray, Lord, that they will be interactive. I pray, Lord, that they would understand that, God, you love them so much. And that today, they get a chance to learn something magnificent from you. May that be true for every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I am a, I'm, somebody throw me the time, what time is it? Somebody got, what time is it? (laughs) I love how everybody just doesn't tell me the time, you throw your opinions. Time to leave, (laughs) time to go longer, don't worry about the time, it's time. (laughs) I I need a clock, I just need a clock. I'm not going to trust any of you, you guys are all lying. (laughs) It's 26, okay, I'm going to need at least another 10 minutes. No musician come up. Oh, there it is. Oh, my gosh. We have like hours. Hours. <laughs> All right. Hey, let me, let me just tell you this. I am absolutely fascinated with God. I'm fascinated by the fact that he um, will take time to prepare us for the things that time will bring our way, given the fact that he's not confined by it. God who lives in eternity and is not confined by by time is able to look into your tomorrow, see what's going to happen, and prepare you so that when that thing happens, he has already done things to prepare you so that you can either be delivered from the storm or walk through it. 
Most of you know that a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I spent five days at the hospital. You know, well, my daughter was being diagnosed and, and us getting acclimated to our new life of her being a type 1 diabetic. In fact, you visited her and it brought a smile to her soul because you rock. <laughs> but we, you know, but it was hard news, you know. I mean, it was hard news for us to hear and to know that for, that for the rest of my life, they were, t they were telling us that my daughter is not going to be able to, uh, to put anything in her mouth and eat it until she pokes herself with a needle two times for the rest of her life. One to test the, 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 her blood sugar, and then the other one to deliver the proper amount of insulin into her body. And I'm watching my little girl just handle it with grace, you know, and, it, and I mean, it, it could have had the potential of being, that's my firstborn, huh? That's my little girl. And it had the potential of really just challenging our family. But can I just take a minute and give kudos to me? Because I'm telling you, I handled it swimmingly. I did. And I'm not just bragging, but I mean, me, me, even my wife and I were talking about it. And she's like, man, you handled that. So yeah, you get your game face on and you were encouraging. And you're like, okay, we're going to do this as, as a family. And we're going to become more structured. And we're going to plan our meals. And we're going we're gonna to amplify some discipline into our eating habits. And, and we're going we're gonna to implement some dietary restrictions and some portion controls and some math. And I mean, it was like, it was, I was pretty awesome. I'm just telling you. And, and if, I think if anybody dealt with it, and it, I think the biggest challenge probably came from my wife because she is just full of faith. She's like, I don't receive that. Pray right now in Jesus' name, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, that can happen, but let's save her life right now and give her some insulin. So we were going through that, but I think the reason my attitude was the right one is not because I'm great in and of myself, but it's because I had, I believe, already adopted an attitude a few months ago when there was a diagnosis spoken over me that I had rheumatoid arthritis. It came on me fast and strong and severe. I could not go to the gym. I couldn't lift the weight. I couldn't walk. I couldn't do squats. I know most of you don't think I do squats anyway, but I do. Okay, I'm just fighting genetics here. I'm just trying to keep up. But point is, it was very difficult. And then the, basically the doctors looked at me and said, for the rest of your life, you will continue to deteriorate. You're going to have joint pains. You're going to have to have medicine. And I know that there is some controversy within the holistic community that you could probably, through dietary restrictions, can be healed from that. And I believe that, but that's not the point. The point is this. The point is that God had already given me an attitude that I believe is applicable to just about any storm, any obstacle, or any challenge that will choose to enter into the life of the Christian. And that is this, that you either have to develop an incredible level of dependability on the God that has the power to deliver you from the storm or to walk you through it. That really is the only choice. Either he's going to heal me or he is going to walk me through. I'm good with either option because it's the only choice we have really towards anything that comes our way. And so there's been a longing and a desire and a sensing in my soul for the church to return to function from a supernatural expression. You do understand that the one thing that separates us from every other organization or even benevolent organization in the entire universe is the fact that our hope is in Him. And He is supernatural. It's the one thing that will keep us from becoming nothing more and nothing less than religious humanism with a Bible. Our dependence on a supernatural God. Because I happen to have been around church long enough to understand that it doesn't matter what denomination you go to. It doesn't matter what church you go to. It doesn't matter uh, what building you enter. What ma everybody in the North American church, we have learned to function out of different elements already. We have learned to function from leadership development. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's the truth of the matter. We've learned to function from, from sharpening our organizational skills. We need to be organized. <laughs> I understand that. 
We, need to, we, need, we have learned to function out of vision casting. We've learned to function even out of mimicking other people's ministries. And I'm okay with that because I don't think that we necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. But if we just look at somebody else's ministry and say, wow, they did it this way and they got that return. If we do it exactly the same way, we'll get the same return. What happens is you lose your sense of authenticity because what needs to happen is we need to grab hold of the horns of the altar and pray to Almighty God as an individual. You will never know what you really like until you spend time in prayer with the one who made you. And I say, if that's true, if that's true personally, then that's also true corporately. Where corporately, we're never really going to know how the expression that God has called us to display until we get together and we find out who we are supposed to be in Him through the avenue of prayer. That's why I love this series, because I think it's going to build the, the culture that God is going to create here. And so if that's true personally, then it must also be true corporately. And as I look at my God, who happens to be a supernatural God, there's just a longing inside of my soul for us to return to the supernatural expression because it's the one thing that sets us apart from everybody else. So the truth is that you have to, you, we have to get to the point where we depend and we develop an incredible dependability on the God that has the power to deliver you from the storm or the potential to walk you through it. Now let me add this. Both of those options require supernatural intervention. In fact, I would, I would render that it takes more faith to believe that somebody will be healed than God will give me the right attitude and the right heart to be able to walk through the storm. They both require divine intervention. So what is divine intervention? Let me, let me teach you something. This. This, is, this is good. Divine intervention is the fulfillment of of this scripture in the book of Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus prayed or where Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. You know that as the Lord's Prayer. I don't like referring to it as the Lord's Prayer. I think it's a disciple's prayer because it was the prayer that Jesus told his disciples. He said, you pray this way, making it not his prayer, but their prayer. There's also something in there about forgive us our sins as we forgive, and Jesus never sinned. So, but anyway, I digress. Point is, in that prayer, Jesus teaches his disciples to pray this. He said, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, oh my, there's so much meat in those few little phrases. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know what the definition of heaven is? The definition of heaven is the dimension of happiness, power, and eternity. Now listen, I would have never chosen those words. I would have never chosen the word happiness. I think I've been taught all my life within church culture that happiness is external. Joy is from within. The joy of the Lord is our strength. You know, I, I, I get it. But we're, we're going back into the original language and into sources written by people who know far more than all of us collectively, and they chose the word happy. So I guess it's okay to be happy. <laughs> like the great prophet, what's his name? He wrote, don't worry, be happy revolutionary <laughs> it made that, that song made everybody happy when it came out and then there was the other one that came out about pharrell has it because i'm happy come along if you feel okay you know <laughs> point is point is the definition of heaven listen this is the definition of heaven heaven is the dimension of happiness power and eternity and you have to think of it as a dimension. You can't think of it as a, as, as a place. Because when you say the word heaven, it conveys with it an attitude which secludes God to a geographical location. And we cannot do that. Because that goes against his very character and his nature. Because his nature is omniscient, meaning that he can be everywhere at one time. Then it becomes very exciting when you recognize that as, a, as a, on earth as it is in heaven. What? So what you're looking at is you're looking at a dimension of happiness and of power and of eternity that is available to everybody who is willing to pull that dimension from heaven down to earth. And you don't have to die and go to heaven to experience that. We can be some of the happiest, some of the most powerful people on this earth because we know that we have eternity in front of us. 
The next dimension. We always talk about the next dimension. The next, you understand? The next dimension. The next dimension is not a, a bigger building. The next dimension is not a permanent location. The next dimension is not more people in attendance. Huh? We begin to get these things, and then we're like, oh, wow, we've entered a new dimension. We're at a new level. No, 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 no. The next dimension is the unadulterated power of happiness and of power and of eternity being unleashed beyond this place into people's homes and businesses and workplaces and families and teenagers and kids and schools and societies and governments and, and, and presidents and every that dimension being released on the earth as a whole. And it happens with just one person listening to what I'm saying and taking it home. If you don't begin to play something, I will come up with more things to say for the next three hours. So somebody start worshiping, seriously. Man, that was too quick, though. That was too quick. I just felt like that was like a shut up with your guitar. <laughs> and this is where I forgot about Peter. I'm sorry. Let me go back to Peter. This is where Peter finds himself. He finds himself in the need for a divine intervention. Peter finds himself in the need for God to do something so amazing that it is not just Jesus paying him attention. It's not just Jesus extending a hand, which he did, but Peter finds himself in a position where he needs divine intervention because God has to break the very laws of physics and gravity and the boy has to walk on water to the place of safety. And so he prays a very short prayer. I think it was, Lord, save me. That is the voice of honesty. <laughs> Lord, save me, he prayed. Because he needed Jesus to not just give him a nice sermon or a Bible study or to just lay hands on him and give him a short prayer. He needed God to intervene supernaturally. I love Peter, man. You understand that the response that Peter gave to Jesus would not have been the response that none of us would have given. Because it communicates something. Peter is in the boat, and the Bible says that there's winds and the waves, and there's a storm happening. In the middle of the storm, when you just thought things could not get worse, they see a ghost walking on the water towards them. Oh, no, you didn't. Somebody give me an oar or something. I'm about to defend myself. Pull out my 9, my 45, my AR. But then they hear the voice. And Jesus says, be of good cheer. It's me. And I love what Peter does. Because the common response would have been very simply, oh, Jesus, we were so scared. I get back in the boat. Peter doesn't do that. Peter says, it's you, Lord. If it's you, bid me to walk towards you. And Jesus said, come. So what he was communicating is, I would rather be in the middle of the wind and the waves and the storm. I'm okay leaving my place of comfort and my place of complacency and my place of security as long as I know I'm walking with you and that you're with me. And so Peter steps out of the boat and begins to walk towards Jesus. And man, he's displaying such faith. The other 11, you understand, are just watching. They're like, man, I hope he doesn't sink. And then guess what happens? He begins to fail. I mean, church people would have already saying, it's talked to each other saying, I knew that wasn't God. <laughs> I knew that, he's just going too far. He's too radical. Stay in the boat, Peter. Why you guys think out so much? And so the Bible says he began to, because he looked at the, he took, took his gaze away from Jesus, put it on the winds and the waves. The Bible says he began to sink, but then no problem. It's okay for you to sink as long as you get your eyes back on Jesus, get your prayer life in order, and then you're going to begin to see that when prayer becomes a priority in your life, you will begin to see a display of divine intervention. Oh, sometimes I just excite myself. I want to give myself an amen. Amen, pastor. Amen. I want to take my bra off and throw it up there. You're rocking the house. <laughs> like I'm at a rock concert or something. I'm telling you. Because I understand the level of faith that it takes to walk on water. Most of the people involved in the leadership of the church are walking on water. They're praying for their kids. They're praying for their families. We, we got families that are being torn apart right now by the wind and by the waves. 
And all you have is the assurance that you've stepped out of the boat at the right time and that you're walking towards the Jesus that promised to either deliver you from the storm or to walk you through it back to a place of safety. Man, that's good. That's the word. That's Jesus. The living word. Come on, how many people are going through a storm and you recognize that you have to either develop an attitude, huh? An attitude that, it, that creates an incredible dependability on the God that has the power to deliver you from the storm or to walk you through it. But either way, you'll be okay. Can we sing that? Hey, can you sing that? Can we just pause for a moment? In the eye of the storm, Jesus. You remain in Come on, sing it with us. Put the words up on us. Jesus. You guard my soul. Lord. You alone are the anchor. Oh, when my sails are torn. Jesus. Your love surrounds me in the eye of Come the Come on, let that message sink it. in your soul. You remain in control. Just close your eyes right now. Just close your eyes and focus on Jesus. And let me just ask you this question. If you've never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, if you've never asked Jesus to forgive you of the sins that are in your life, 
the Bible says that sin will never enter heaven. That's the bad news. The good news is that, st- that sin can be forgiven. If you simply look to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Give me a new life today. If that is you this morning and you want to receive Jesus as your Savior and have your sins forgiven, we're not going to ask you to do anything but to lift your hands so that we can pray for you and with you right where you are. So if that's you, let me see your hands right now. If you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, yes, yes, yes. Let me just pray. Say, every, Let's do this together. Come on, it's very simple. Huh? This is just a ritual that we do, at least for now. So we, for you to take ownership of some words that should be coming out of your soul anyway. But let's do it collectively with our brothers and sisters who lifted their hands this morning and say, Dear Jesus, forgive me for the sins I've committed. I ask for forgiveness. I repent before you. And I give you my life from this day forward. Teach me how to live in the way that you intended for me to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you put your hands together for Jesus? I know you guys are thinking, of, can we just do the song again real quick? I know you're going to come up, Jeff. I know we got some video. But listen, I feel like some of you also need to have your faith just, uh, you need God to like put salt back in your meal again to be able to taste and see that the Lord is good. And some of you just need your faith to be lifted up so that when you leave this place, you have the faith again to believe, man. You have the faith to believe that there will be a divine intervention for the things that really matter to you as you bring him forward to the Lord in prayer. Let's do the song again huh in the eye of the storm you remain in control come on everybody let it be the anthem of your song you guard my soul you love now the anchor when my sails are torn your love surrounds me and i love that line in the eye of the storm you remain in control and in the middle you guard my soul You love, not the anchor When my sails are torn Your love surrounds me Give me one more time You remain in control And in the middle of the war You guard my soul You love, not the anchor my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the Let me pray for you. Dear Jesus, I pray for every person within the sound of my voice right now, Lord. I ask that you will begin to lift the level of their faith, Lord. I pray that you would give us the tenacity to develop an attitude. Huh? An attitude with an incredible dependability on the God who's going to do one of two things. He's either going to deliver us from the storm or walk us through it. But either way.